But um, I'm very pleased to invite, uh, to uh, have us, uh, and, and I want to say well, this is the last thing today, but this is certainly not the end of the discussion. And part of what we will do uh, post this event is send out some information, including all of the presentations that you saw, but also to talk about who wants to work on what, uh, what good ideas or what thoughts or what connection did you make today, and how can we work together uh, to further the issue uh, as well, too, and to address uh, the issues of housing for many of the seniors that we all know. So, but we have with us today uh, a group of folks, Linda, Linda Couch, who you heard from earlier from Leading Age, but next to her on the left is Kathy from POA, who's the Vice President of Resident Services and Community Improvement. Many of you know at the far, sorry, I'm doing you out of order here, but Linda Katz is in the red right at the end, uh, and is the Economic Progress Institute co-founder and policy director, and uh, is the person I turn to when I want to know anything about healthcare <laughs> in the state, so glad to have Linda here. And Roberta uh, from St. Elizabeth is the Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. And St. Elizabeth, I, I, I think you know, has done a lot of great innovative work in the senior housing space. So with that, oops, got to get my questions, hold on. <laughs> with that, I'm going to just open it up for some discussion uh, with our panelists. And I'll throw the first question out, and I'll let ev everyone jump in uh, if you uh, want to uh, answer this question, but can you give one example or a, a example of a successful partnership or model that connects housing and health care for seniors? Anyone want to jump in? Sure. <laughs> so you've heard a little bit about the SASH program periodically throughout the day and in our last session, so I want to tell you a little bit about the SASH program and St. Elizabeth's um, role in what we're doing here in Rhode Island. Can you hear me in the back? So SASH is an evidence-based model that was started about eight or nine years ago in Vermont, and it stands for Services and Supports at Home. And basically, SASH uses the elder's home, affordable housing, is the platform to provide services. And it provides comprehensive care management and coordination in the affordable housing by embedding a SASH wellness nurse and a SASH coordinator. Um, and they work with a team of community agencies around the table to help provide supportive services to the people who live in elderly housing. Um, the program is voluntary and it's free of charge, so people have to decide to participate in the, in the SASH program. In Vermont, every housing facility is now in SASH. They started with one and that was their pilot project, and now every entity is involved, and 5,000 people are in the SASH program in Vermont. So it's, uh, evi again, <coughs> evidence-based. Um, SASH has demonstrated consistent and significant improvement in quality metrics, and in many cases, that even exceeds national benchmarks around things like advanced directives, immunizations, controlled hypertension, diabetes, decrease in falls. So SASH is one model that successfully links healthcare and housing sectors to improve the health outcomes and reducing the growth of Medicare expenses, as we talked earlier. And they're saving about $1,536 per member per year, times 5,000 members is a lot of dollars that they're saving. Right now they're in the process of um, looking at their Medicaid savings and, and they're being studied for that. So we'll have more information forthcoming. So thanks to the Tufts Health Plan Foundation for their support, St. Elizabeth's community is piloting the SASH program at St. Elizabeth Place in Providence. So first I want to give you a snapshot of what St. Elizabeth Place is, some of you may know. We're um, right across the street from Classical High School, just down the road from Crossroads. 149 apartments with about 160 or 70 residents who live in those apartments. Um, and the makeup of those residents, of, of those that are self-identifying, the majority are Hispanic, followed by the residents that identify as black or African American. Over 83% of the residents are over the age of 65, and the majority, um, with the majority, 38% between 75 and 84, and 15% are 85 and older. So it's a very, very old population that we serve there. 95 of the households, or 64% of the residents, 
have an income of under $9,999. And 23% of the residents have an income between $10,000 and $15,000. And just over 2.5% have an income of less than $5,000. So we're talking about very frail, very um, poor, and a diverse population. So now on to the pilot project. With the Tufts Health Plan Foundation dollars, we received um, support and consulting from SASH, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, to bring the program here and pilot it in Rhode Island. We've hired a SASH coordinator and a SASH wellness nurse, and they might be out here somewhere. <laughs> Raise your hand, you're still here? Yep. Yeah, yeah. One, two back there. <laughs> um, and they're doing a great job. Uh, we're really pleased. We launched the program this spring, and we have over 30 residents that have already decided to participate. Um, the SASH coordinator helps each participant identify their goals and facilitate access to healthcare programs and social needs, while the wellness nurse provides each participant with an assessment and coaching in particular issues around chronic conditions. And we already talked about the importance and the, um, the number of chronic conditions that people have in, in subsidized housing. And then a collaboration of community partners, and one of ours is the Providence Center, um, come around the table and really help us and the residents meet their needs. And I think that that's probably the key to the program. The goals of the resident is where we start. It's very resident-centered. So somebody may have many co comorbidities, but if that person, and this is an example from Vermont, wants to get up every morning and volunteer at the nursery school, and there's something that's stopping that individual from doing that, that's where we start. <laughs> it's what do we need to do to get him back to his volunteer. You build that trust, you build that relationship, and before you know it, you can work on the health issues. So we're very excited about the, the program and um, look forward to continuing the pilot. And if successful and have the partnership of the state, we'd like to see this in obviously other, other facilities as well. So that sounds like a very successful partnership. Anyone else want to add any other uh, examples that they know either from Rhode Island or from other experiences? Kathy? I'll jump in. Um, I'm from Preservation of Affordable Housing and we have properties and residents in nine states in the District of Columbia. So I get to um, see how different states respond. First, I will say Rhode Island is in a leadership position, so I'm not importing any ideas to you, but we are, we are exercising a model, actually, that we're aspiring to have across all our properties. We have now 86 properties with about 10,000 um, residents, 10,000 units, sorry, of housing. So we're trying to figure out how to make absolute best use of resources. And what we have done is decide first to build out our resident service coordination. We call them community impact coordinators <coughs> because we only have those uh, heroic individuals in half of our properties. And that's unacceptable. That's the base the, because they are the trust link to the residents. And here in Rhode Island, what we've done is, is take this another step to in many properties contract with CareLink to provide that coordination in our properties, thereby immediately getting 100% smarter about the service system in Rhode Island. Uh, operating from Boston, well, you all know this, how stupid you can be operating from Boston. So <laughs> we, we really believe and, and have had it proven that contracting with local agencies that know the networks and know the resources uh, are an automatically better way of providing basic resident service coordination, on top of which we're uh, always striving to build uh, additional services and connections for services for our residents. But that partnership model, we're now taking uh, across the country, basically saying, we never, I promise my healthcare friends, we never plan to be a healthcare provider. We want to be a quality housing provider with green and healthy communities where people can age in place. But we never plan to be uh, a service provider. We need partners who can do that, both mostly social service providers, but then occasionally health providers are necessary and we're obviously happy to host them. 
So unless anyone else wants to add anything, I'll uh, just ask and uh, throw out another question. And uh, how can, what's the most powerful way or what is a way that housing developers can build partnerships with healthcare service providers or vice versa? If somebody wants to <laughs> talk about how to health service providers can uh, partner up with uh, housing developers. <coughs> anyone want to? Take I'm a saving for myself for number three. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any thoughts? Linda, have you seen any great models across the country? Well, I guess I would say that it really varies. I mean, it's a whole hodgepodge of ways that our housing providers are in, and our healthcare providers are working back and forth. Um, on the housing side, um, I know that more and more we are reaching more and more of our housing uh, members are reaching out to insurance companies mm -hmm. united healthcare is really big in this space and they're really interested in in figuring out ways to use the platform of affordable housing just the sheer number of 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 people so these um the senior care um, or the SCOs, like a, a special mm, needs plans, special yeah. needs plans, yeah. right? And so yeah. the, in Massachusetts, I think they're the SCOs. SCOs. Mm -hmm. And so the um, see, that's the jargon too, right? We're like the healthcare jargon. Like, <laughs> healthcare. I don't even know the healthcare jargon. So the um, um, that's health jargon. That's health jargon. Figuring <laughs> out. So if if you have a hundred residents in your affordable housing community and they participate in four or five different health plans, mostly. How do you bring those four or five different health plans together into your property in a way that they're going to work together and not fight over residents? Um, but maybe you have to partner with another building or another couple of buildings and, and then divide. You know what I mean? And so it's figuring out who's willing, who's mm -hmm. able to come mm -hmm. to the table. But I know that our members are, are trying to have those, those initial conversations and, and really try to match who's in their building and and figure out who's providing those services, who's paying for those services. And and that's a huge incentive for people to come to the table and try to figure that out. So I guess my advice is just to start those conversations with um, the insurance companies are a big um, a big link and I, it might even be easier than going to CMS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All things being relative, right? right. <laughs> Have you seen any, any particular state policies in both uh, Kathy and Linda that work cross state um, that have helped uh, encourage those kind of relationships or, or required uh, insurers or others right. uh, to invest in this? Anyone? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think we, we talked in our uh, housing session about so called mishmash of regulations. There, there are a lot, and then they are a convergence of well intended laws protecting our residents under the Fair Housing Act and Medicaid and Medicare recipients under HIPAA, the health information. So there, there are many well-intended barriers to collaboration. They can all be overcome, but you have to do it one side with the other very carefully to respect our residents' uh, privacy. The, the resident, the, our buildings are full of people who have choice about where they live, right. about what insurance they have, they change it regularly. So we don't have the luxury of having one insurance provider to talk to um, other than, well, Rhode Island looks really attractive from that perspective mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think all roads lead to Medicaid. Mm -hmm. I think we have the most shared purpose with Medicaid. And Medicaid, we've been told many times, cannot pay for housing. Right. Uh, they can pay for housing support services, but. I'm not convinced yet uh, yeah. when, when a state is really up against the wall with homeless elders uh, that they won't figure out a creative way. New York State has figured out how to take its Medicaid savings and commit it to increased supply of housing. That's, I like that because if what you do is set up a situation where health people are all really interested in the existing pool of Section 8 we're all going to lose on that score. We need more affordable housing to attend to the needs of vulnerable elders, vulnerable families, vulnerable children. So it, the supply has to be attended to and places like New York State put 50, I think it was 50, it was a lot of money, 40 or 50 million dollars aside for right. increased supply of housing. I love the sound of that. And in the meantime, getting Medicaid policies and, and states are going to have a lot of flexibility, I think, with this administration to use Medicaid money as glue money to, to glue together people who are moving from Medicare Advantage programs to Medicaid eligibility 
all living in our, uh, we, we're, they're with us almost forever, but they move through eligibility as their income uh, declines and their health gets more complicated. And I would say, so I think that, and you'll know in like four seconds if you ever figured out a way, I'm not a healthcare person, but the, um, <laughs> The money follows the, the person program, right, deinstitutionalizing people who were prematurely or without choice um, put in institutional settings. The Olmstead um, Supreme Court decision in 1999 that said people have a right to receive services that they need to live in a community. They, need, they have a right to get those services in a community-based setting, in a home setting. And um, states can't comply with the Olmstead decision unless they have affordable housing, right? There, there are services out there, um, but if there's no affordable housing, they can't do that. One way that the federal government was trying to help states deinstitutionalize people was to give people, was to these, through these money, money follows the person, um, Grants, I guess, are they grants or uh, cash? Uh, grants, or? I think we've got some folks here. Grants, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> and so one innovative thing that, I mean, and you can't use that money for for rental assistance. Right. I think you can maybe use it for right. move -in assist, moving right. assistance or right. maybe a security deposit, but you can't use it for ongoing rental assistance. Somehow, the, the state of New Jersey, um, they said they got approval. I don't know. They they um, had <laughs> they been do using things differently in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> they use their their money follows the person money um, um, to to subsidize an operating subsidy, so a rental assistance subsidy for low income through the lo through their low income housing tax credit qualified application plan. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, they talked to a lot of housing developers, and they said basically, how much would we have to pay you? to bump to the top of your housing waiting list people coming from nursing homes. And then the amount they came to was $75,000 a unit. Mm -hmm. And so through the QAP in New Jersey, um, and New Jersey was using its, um, people are looking at me like, now. They, they were using their money follows the person um, cash to subsidize the, the ongoing rents of tax credit mm -hmm. tenants. Hmm. See, they can do it. Um, and so, you know, but it's true. It's like we've got to crack the health care. That's where the money is, right? The money is overwhelmingly on the health care side. And, well, the um, health care people tell us there isn't there the is money a, there. So, well, I mean, that's the challenge, but um, I know. But it seems like right. there is, or at least the, the systems need to be there. Yeah, well, the other issue is, is that there's money in the United States, right? It's like we have the cash to do it. We're just choosing to spend our resources. Mm -hmm. On no, something really else. So. so, Linda, let's bring you into the conversation. The uh, what what next steps are there to take to to continue this cross sector communication that we've not started today? It's been ongoing, but continued. Right. We tried to develop some new relationships, but and what can we work on together to address senior health and housing needs? So, I guess I just um, I, I like Kathy saying all roads lead to Medicaid. Um, I think in in Rhode Island. If we could get Medicaid right, um, the, so one in 10 seniors we are enrolled in Medicaid in our state. So that's a lot of people in Medicaid. And there are some opportunities with Medicaid, not for Medicaid to pay for housing, but there's a whole bunch of initiatives that have been going on in Rhode Island that we really could be um, uh, doing a better job at um, in, in terms of putting um, reality to the rhetoric of rebalancing care in our state, which many in this room have been working on for when our hair was not dyed. <laughs> um, and it was called something else. <laughs> it's been called very different different names. But I, I, so I just want to throw out, I guess, a couple of things. One is I know that um, Dr. Trilla from Neighborhood was, was Yes, I apologize. I thank you, Linda. He was uh, had an emergency and wasn't able to join us at right. the last minute. So but I know you. there are um, some Medicaid reps, uh, some neighborhood health plan folks here. So neighborhood have been trying, even before rebalancing care and our integrated care initiative, to try to figure out how to improve health care for seniors, including creating a program where, surprise, doctor, the health team goes out to the person's home. Right? Uh -huh. That's a that's a great idea. Um, there is uh, Rhode Island uh, with with Medicaid. The states can ask for waivers, and Rhode Island, as many people may know, has operated our Medicaid program under an 1115. That's just the 
federal law that says the state can waive some of the Medicaid rules. Rhode Island has been one of the states that's really been tr trying to be creative about getting um, uh, waivers to certain Medicaid rules where you can use Medicaid, serv with Medicaid funding for things that aren't normally paid for by Medicaid. And so, what, for example, Rhode Island in its last waiver request got approval to pay for home stabilization services. And it took a really long time before a, the waiver went in and CMS approved it, then it took years before the state decided that it would fund it, because it does always come back to the money, right? But there is now um, a home stabilization program where there are, and this may be something that housing folks can think about reaching out to community providers or we can all think about a better way of engaging more people. If you have resident service coordinators in, um, in public housing, um, hopefully they are able to do the same sort of services that these um, home stabilization folks would do. There are 10 um, agencies in the state that are certified as home stabilization programs. Um, they include CAP agencies, behavioral health agencies, domestic violence agencies, and some homeless providers. Um, they're required to serve anybody, not just sort of their target population. And uh, they, the services that they provide are to help identify um, and in, uh, behaviors that may jeopardize somebody staying in their housing, um, provide education and training on the roles and rights responsibilities of the landlord and tenant, um, coaching on developing and maintaining relationships with landlords and property managers, adv advocacy and linkage with community resources to prevent eviction, assistance with housing recertification process if somebody is in subsidized housing and needs to recertify, and coordinate, develop a housing support plan with that tenant. So the whole idea there is to help people who are in housing um, maintain their housing, and then hopefully part of that is connecting with their um, health care providers as well. There's another part of home stabilization which Rhode Island has not yet funded but was approved by CMS, which was housing location. I think the problem with housing location is there's no housing to find. So <laughs> unless you're already in, I mean, and that, that's the problem, right? We really need to deal yeah. with, in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. increasing the supply of housing, increasing the supply of affordable housing. Um, and we need to, as we're thinking about that, we need to be breaking down uh, we can't be thinking about, well, Medicaid says they don't have the money for this and housing says they don't have the money for that. Uh -huh. We need to be thinking about anything we're doing, figuring out that this is a state obligation to provide stable, affordable housing for folks along with the health care services they need to stay healthy. And that means things like uh, Rhode Island is now moving down the road for accountable entities, right? We were fully managed care and the, we had only two managed care plans, we now have three. Those managed care plans were told by the state to do a lot in terms of truly managing care for their populations, but then the state decided, well, that's not enough of managing, now we're gonna push risk down to these accountable entities where we're gonna now have, um, in other states called accountable care organizations, we're going to um, require the, the health plans to contract with groups of um, primary and acute care providers who deal with physical and behavioral health care, hospitals, specialists, and these accountable entities are supposed to address the social determinants of health. The state is now in the, um, now developing. Can they work on world peace too? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, so this is, so this is, so now what we need to do is hold them, we have to hold those, we have to hold the state accountable for the accountable ent care entities. And we have to say, look, Part of this is you're wanting to save some money, right? Yeah. You're pushing uh -huh. risk down to right, this provider right. network. They're gonna have shared savings. Well, that money, A, they have, A those accountable have entities save. need to be assessing people for housing security and safety, as well as food security and safety. Those are the right. two basic things to me that as we're moving this forward, the networks need to be assessing, and then when they assess, how well do they assess the patients in their networks? And once they find out that there's a need, what do they do? We know that they can probably solve some of the um, food needs, right? You can refer somebody to a food bank, you can make sure they're getting SNAP, you can refer them to somebody who's gonna help them get SNAP, but what are you gonna do when you find out they're living in substandard housing or parked in a car, right? right. Mm -hmm. 
there isn't a solution there. So we need to make sure that as Medicaid is doing these accountable entity things, okay. that those providers are tracking the need and then we are going to the legislature together to say, yeah, Medicaid can't pay for housing, but state, if you want to achieve your Medicaid savings through these accountable entities, then you have to make sure that there's affordable housing for folks. And it's not my pool, your pool, it's going to the, it's going to the governor and it's going to the legislature to say, this is all of a piece. And you have to uh, break down those silos. There's also, um, the state's uh, 1115 waiver is coming up for renewal. Um, that means that we have some opportunities to say to EOHHS, here's some other waivers of Medicaid rules. Well, I don't think we're, I mean, maybe under this administration they'll let us pay for rent, but I wouldn't support that, I think, because our Medicaid budget is so big, you know, if we try to get Medicaid to pay for housing, we'll lose things elsewhere, like just coverage for folks. But I do think there's some ways for us to get together as a housing and healthcare community to say, well, just like people had a push really to get the state to submit the home stabilization proposal in its waiver, there may be some other things that we can do. And I, I know that the secretary is interested in figuring out some of those things and maybe some of it is coming from the work that you're doing um, with the aging and community, right? Let's th because here's an opportunity to say, hey, we can get the feds to share in the cost of X with Medicaid dollars, not rent, but other things. So let's be creative about what some of those things well, are. Well, one of the things that came up in the housing group is trying to repurpose um, uh, nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And well, how can we, can that be the thing <laughs> that we look at and how do we make those multi-generational or multi, uh, use uh, facilities to address the senior need? I'm, I'm just- No, and, and clearly, that. you know, if you look at the trend and the rebalancing, every year we lose to nursing facilities. And I don't know, um, you know, it was good to hear somebody said, well, there's, oh, I think it was Joan. There are more nursing home beds going empty for longer periods of time. I don't know that we have the data about, you know, why are we so behind? And why can't we break through that issue and maybe repurposing is part of it? But I think we need to be much stronger politically all together to make sure that we are truly moving the dollars. And again, it's the, it's the um, putting the money behind the rhetoric. And it just feels like we keep getting stuck. So that's another thing I think we need to work on together. And the last thing I'll throw out is that there is the um, hospital community benefits, um, right? And I think that's also a resource that we've not been aggressive about in terms of talking to hospitals where before community benefits for hospitals was just, oh, well, what do we do about health care in the community with our community benefit program? But they have an obligation under state law to have a um, community benefits plan. And we have the opportunity to participate in that process. It's not just about health care anymore, it's about health. So now that we have the mantra of social determinants of health, and. I shouldn't be facetious about saying the mantra because I think people really do start to think now that of the intersection of safe housing um, uh, is health, health needs safe, safe housing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's good. And so how do we make that real um, on the ground? And the community benefits route, I think, is another place that we should be looking at together. Before I open up for a few questions, anyone on the panel have any uh, last thoughts or comments? And I'll open it up to see if anyone has a question for our panelists or a, a comment that they would like to make. I, I shouldn't have wine. told you about the wine and the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Maureen. Um, I just wanted to comment, and maybe Roberta can follow up on it. Um, it's my understanding that the stash program in Vermont, which has been so successful, started out with some Medicare funding because when we had the Medicare mm -hmm. demonstration projects, yeah. they were able to negotiate with CMS to use some of those Medicare dollars. So when um, Linda said, the money's in health care, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's, what that's yeah. where some of it gets yeah. stopped mm -hmm. from, yeah. looking mm -hmm. at those health care dollars and, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do with that? Mm -hmm. And that's true, the SASH program did start out with a demonstrate. First of all, they got foundation support initially for their first year. Um, and then they got some CMS dollars. They also had some state dollars through their SIMS grant 
um, mm -hmm. as well. So they really put together a patchwork of mm -hmm. dollars to make it work. And now they're part of their Vermont all payer system. Mm -hmm. And, and oh. they're a permanent part of their, yeah. their ongoing system. So they figured it out. They figured yeah. it out. <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can figure it we out. We can figure it out, too. We're smart. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Mary. I've read about um, Bonsacur Hospital investing in housing for low income. Does anybody know hmm. results or yeah. Uh, no, I can't speak to I that. Can, you I know? can speak to it because yeah. we, we haven't talked about hospital systems and health plans other than United actually investing their capital right. in housing. Housing, especially with the low income tax credit structure, is a very good investment. Mm -hmm. It's not risky at all, in my view. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm a Hauser, so I could say that. <laughs> um, but the, the Catholic hospital systems, uh, Dignity, Trinity, mm -hmm. Bon have been leaders in this area for over 15 years. They understood you know, the connection between housing and health mm -hmm. and have made real dollar commitments. There's a push afoot, but it hasn't gotten an awful lot of traction to have that counted as part of the community benefit obligation mm -hmm. because those hospitals give out community benefit investments like year-to-year -year grants, little, little ones. But they're sitting, I'm obviously biased, on a lot of money that they could very safely invest right. in low-income housing mm -hmm if they were encouraged to. That may be where policy is a good idea because they generally treat their assets as a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and they United, also, they I, also I, real estate. I mean, they often, oh, they yeah. own real that's estate the that they right? oh, sure. actual development sure. on. Right. That, that's where right. the irony yeah. is that the for-profit uh, United has way ahead of the nonprofits, other than the Catholic hospital systems. They are all over the country investing in things like this quite innovative uh, work. Uh, I'm sad to say I haven't scored any of that money, but <laughs> <laughs> You're working on it's it. another day, you know. <laughs> All right, so a lot of food for thought. So before I let you go to the food, let me just tell you, thank you again for coming, and thanks to all of our uh, panelists and all of our participants, Joan and, and Jim and our sponsors. We are going to uh, follow up uh, via email, so make sure we have your email address if you didn't sign in to give you all of the materials, but also to ask you if you're interested in participating in various working groups or other, work, uh, other efforts to kind of keep this discussion going. Uh, we know we can't stop because we know the demand and the need is, is too great. Um, and the uh, you people who are here in the room who are on the ground day to day know that even better. But thank you all. Thank you too to my colleagues at Housing Works, Amy and Emily, we're helping with registration. Annette and Christina from our research team uh, are here as well too. And uh, thanks for your time. And uh, let's keep working till we get this right. Thanks, thanks. again. Thank you. Thank you.